Up next, the story of one of the greatest hidden gems of the entire 1980s. It's a breathtaking song. It's one of my favorite songs ever. This song is gonna make your heart stop cold. It's told by its singer-songwriter. Now, if you love the 1980s, this one is a no-brainer, I'm telling you. The story of this 1987 Pop classic, next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. I tell you what, if you have ever worn out a cassette tape by literally playing it to death on your stereo or Walkman where it just dies, you're gonna love this channel and community. Make sure that you subscribe right now below and do look us up on Patreon to become an insider with us. By the way, that memory was shared by a screen named Fukunering. I hope I'm saying that right. Make sure to share your memory with us below. We may just use it. Now it's time for another episode of our series, Revelations, where featured artists reveal rare stories about their greatest songs. What do you think about uh, these new genres that are made up years after the music was actually released? That's kind of a new thing, right? It's like yacht rock. Really smooth music, also known as yacht rock. It's about late 70s and early 80s soft rock. Sailing takes me away to where or Sophistapop. I'll keep holding on. It's about music that emerged uh, in the mid 80s in the UK, which had elements of soul and jazz and pop. Acts like Simply Red and Swing Out Sister, Johnny Hates Jazz, Prefab Sprout, Sade, Baja, and Danny Wilson. Part of me thinks it's kind of ridiculous because it's after the fact, but then part of me thinks it's pretty cool as it brings new life and new interest to certain music. So today I'm feeling the latter. So on this installment of Revelations, Really excited to share a Zoom session that I did focused on one of my favorite songs of all time, one of the crown jewels of this uh, genre, Sophista Pop, uh, the 1987 worldwide hit Mary's Prayer by Danny Wilson with the band singer and songwriter Gary Clark. It's a great interview. This is one of the saddest, most heart-wrenching songs of the entire decade, maybe ever. It's been reintroduced to new fans through its use in movies, films like uh, Something About Mary and uh, Blinded by the Light recently. Gary Clark is a very gifted songwriter and a gifted song teller. The power of your beauty, Mary. This is gonna be one of your favorite songs after you hear it. Now, as we go into this interview with Gary Clark, I wanna thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the brand that I always wear. When you go to zenny.com, you can customize your eyewear with a a prescription lens or a non-prescription lens, if you just want that cool look or a certain color, particular style of lens, you'll love all the variety. Check it out today. So here is Gary with the story of Mary's Prayer. I know that you and Jed Grimes were in a variety of like London-based bands uh, when you moved to London, Clark's Commandos and Dream Kitchen. Tell me about that process as you were finding your musical identity and what led to Danny Wilson. Well, it was in London that I really made that breakthrough and wrote the songs that became kind of the cornerstone of what was Danny, what became Danny Wilson. So I wrote Mary's Prayer when I was there. I wrote Davy. Broken China, all from the first album. But when we arrived in London, we went through this period of like, we, we got a sound like the bands that are around us and being signed. And a lot of them were influenced by, and I love Talking Heads, but that was kind of a big thing at that point in time. And so for a while we had this kind of scratchy, rhythmic, kind of early Talking Heads kind of a vibe going on. I knew that I had to try and figure out how to get my own thing. And it wasn't until I really let my influences from before. What do I love? I love Steely Dan. I love Stevie Wonder. I love Bacharach and David. I love let let those influences in. And the minute I did, it was like just floodgates opened. I just found I found my voice vocally as well. Well, now is it true that you got discovered while busking? We did busk, but that's not how we got signed. We got signed playing. Um, a gig in a little bar in Edinburgh, a music journalist, his name was Bob Flynn. I didn't know he was there. There was only about 
four people in the audience, but he he saw us play and he wrote this review, the shimmering, glimmering hope of Clark's vocals and, you know. Kind of started this tsunami of record company interest. Now that you signed with Virgin Records in 86, called Spencer Tracy. So because we were one of the first bands on Virgin US, on Virgin America. Virgin UK didn't really have a problem with it. That's why the train rolled on as it did. But when they played the record to Virgin America, they said, we think we've got a hit record here, and particularly hit song, Mary's Prayer. And so um, it was really just a simple case of it's too risky, you can't use it. They, they have the right to, you know. And now my, obviously my brother Kit was in the band and we just were throwing names around. And I think it was Kit who said, if we won't let them name the band after an actual person, why don't we name it after a fictional character? We had a minute to come up with that name. Of course, a Frank Sinatra film, talking about Sinatra. I understand that that was a, a favorite of your dad's, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Meet Danny Wilson, released in 87. Great record, now called Sophistapop. Elements of soul and jazz and bossa nova. One of the most beautiful songs of the 80s. Truly elegant Mary's Prayer. I've waited decades to ask about this. As I've told you, it's one of my favorite songs. In America, it hit number 23. And it hit number three in the UK after three tries. We'll talk about that. But number nine, in South Africa, number four in Israel, number five in Ireland. Because I listened to the top 40 countdown every single week as a, as a kid, because I grew up in a small town, nothing to do. And, and pop music was my window to the world. This song just took me away to a, just a different place. It's just such an amazing song. And I, I want to ask you about writing it, recording it, and its release and legacy. But first of all, writing it. Such a personal and honest song, heart-wrenching at certain points. What inspired it? I always say this, that that there was a true thing happened to me in the sense that I lost a girlfriend and regret. She actually came back to me and then we split up again, but that was another story. When I was a kid, like I grew up in an Irish Catholic family and went to a Catholic school. And so grew up around all those hymns and the religious language and... But by the age of around 14, I kind of, I never really lost my sense of spirituality, but I, I left the church. But the, the language kind of inspired me. When I got into writing lyrics, there was a period that I wrote maybe three or four songs where I was trying to use that language from hymns and stuff. Um, and Mary's Prayer was the last one of those songs that I wrote. A friend of mine lent me a keyboard, and I, I was really a guitar player. I'd never owned a keyboard. A Juno 60, which was a really early uh, Roland synth. This was in London, and I switched this thing on. And the first sound that comes up is just like a, kind of like a saw wave, kind of ugly, ugly sound. But I played these chords on the white note, which not on the white notes, which is the verse of Mary's Prayer. I used to be so careless if I could I loved the sound and I just immediately started singing. The verse melody came into my head, almost the full verse fully formed and lyric lyrically. Suddenly the heavens roll. Suddenly the rain. And I kept trying to write a chorus for it and nothing felt good enough. Like nothing felt as good as the verse. I just kept going on it and then rejecting choruses. I must have rejected 20 ideas easily. And then probably about a year later, I still had this verse. And I was watching Top of the Pops, which was the big um, chat show on TV here. <laughs> Karma Chameleon by um, Culture Club. Karma, Karma, Karma had this really bright major key kind of almost country and western kind of a feel to it somehow i don't know and it made me pick the guitar up and go back to mary's prayer this time not on the keyboard but on the guitar started singing it and then when i hit the major chord going into the chorus hallelujah you know that's the 
that's the key to it. It doesn't sound like Karma Chameleon, but it's actually true that that song was the unlocker of the chorus for me. An extended Catholic metaphor, that imagery, especially in the chorus with the, the Hail Marys and the Save Me. You said in past interviews it was just really a device to, to relate to past, present, and future. Yeah, but also to glorify the love for this girl. You know, like that's, to me, what the language does is it elevates the love. I mean, that's, that's what it did. That's certainly what it makes me feel. And so, you know, even little subtle things like every, every single day she sends. Every single day she sends. Everything is free. Which is, doesn't make sense, really. But, you know, you say a day that God sends. It's those little things that, just glorify the love, which to me makes the, the loss even greater. I think that's what people respond to, the feeling. You know, I don't think they need to really necessarily understand that song to sort of feel that song. I mean, that's what makes it timeless. It's interesting because the internet and technology has ruined some of that in a way because even like the lyrics, they say a lyric sheet that says, um, she says instead of she sends. And it's like, that's not what the lyric is. It drives me, that one drives me crazy because we've actually now, you know, Mary's Prayer has actually been recorded by recording artists with the wrong lyric, with the internet lyric. You know, it drives me nuts. Everything is wonderful. Being here is heavenly. Everything is wonderful. Being here is heavenly. Every single day she sends, everything is free. She sends, everything is free. That feels like talking about the past. You're kind of talking about when you were with her. Well, my intention was that that first verse is the past. And then when suddenly the heavens. Suddenly the heavens roll. Suddenly the rain that's the change. You know, that's the cut. That's the change. Like now we're in the present and it's not good. That was what I intended to happen. That's the way I intended it to feel, whether that comes across. Or not. It does. Even in the present, you're saying, I used to be so careless as if I couldn't care less. You're talking about the past in the present. Careless. Did I have to make this mess? When you're talking about, did I have to make this mess? And when I was Mary's prayer, I mean, that is such a, it's a regret, it's so personal. And as a listener, when you hear that, we've been through that. We've been through that moment where maybe we have a relationship where everything we've ever wanted is right in front of us, but we're too blind to see it because we're focused on other things. I made such a big when I, was when I saw the music video, it goes through the whole thing and then it shows like a glimpse of what Mary could be, but it's only for like four or five seconds. They were clever, those people. That was Sue Huntley and Donna Muir. I like songs that move you, and I like songs that make you feel something, you know? Well, when you say, suddenly was washed away the Mary that I knew. Was, away, Mary that I knew. was it just something where you regretted it after the relationship was over? I'm just curious about that. My regret from that relationship, I was very young, and my regret was just that the fear of losing the person makes you very possessive and makes you very jealous. But for other people, it can mean other things. I don't even really like saying that in a weird way because like you say, it means something different to you. It means something different to every person. As I say, actually, when I wrote the song, I wasn't feeling those emotions. I was remembering them. I wasn't, I wasn't in that situation. In fact, I've always found it quite difficult to write about things when I'm in them. I find it, easier with just a little bit of perspective, you know. The chorus is just so powerful. I just love the be the light of my eyes and leave a light on in heaven for me. Leave a light on in heaven for me. Leave a light on in heaven for me. Again, that Catholic imagery. There was another song that influenced that as well. There was a song on the first Ricky Lee Jones album called Company. She says, I'll see you in another lifetime. And I, I just found that really moving that she would say, maybe not this lifetime, but in another. And, and 
that even though it's nothing like the same sentence that's i think that influenced me that you know so leave a light on in heaven for me with that so that, that's kind of what that's saying i always loved the power of, of the beginning of that second verse man it just punches you right in the face when it says bless blessed is the one who shares the power in your mm. beauty mary blessed is the millionaire <laughs> Who shares your wedding day, and that's looking into the future. Almost like worshiping the idea of this goddess and what could have been. You're, you're letting her go by literally saying, I can picture you having a happy life with somebody else now. Go and do it. You know, um, he's a lucky guy. It's funny, you're making me think about the stuff that I haven't thought about since I wrote it. You're good. But I think the fact that he's saying, go and have a beautiful life, I think makes it even hard. It hits you even harder when when you realize what he's lost. So The bridge is always, to me, is one of the most mysterious and just incredible bridges in a pop song ever. If you want the fruit to fall, have to give the If you want the fruit to fall, you have to give the tree a shake. But if you shake the tree too hard, the bough is going to break. That always reminded me of is where you're not fragile enough with the relationship or, or tender enough with the relationship. I don't know. That was my interpretation of it. Actually, weirdly, I haven't thought about this for a really long time, but again, you're, you're good at this. But the, the um, I think that relates to what I was saying about jealousy and about like trying to hold on to somebody so tightly that you actually can break the thing. That was a massive lesson for me in life. And we have it in our culture, don't we? We have this kind of thing of, it's in songs, like... Um, be mine, you know? But I've heard that people have played this at their wedding and I even had to tell my kids, oh, this is the greatest love song. Like, this is not a love song. Listen to the lyrics. This is about somebody who's very possessive and obsessed. And But that's what I love about this bridge is that you you talk about that the fragileness of, of the relationship and possessiveness and things like that. But then you come back at the end there and, and say that part at the end. Can't reach the top of the tree. Maybe you can hold me up there what I wouldn't give to be when I was Mary's prayer. The whole song anchors on that whole what I wouldn't give to be when I was Mary's prayer. I knew I had to come back to that, like just from a songwriting perspective. Like that's what the, the pivot of the whole song is that. My favorite part in the entire song is when you're to the very end of the song and you just kind of let out almost like a yelp, like, save me. Oh, man. oh, I love that. That's that's definitely that vocal was very inspired. So as we talked about the song, what do you remember about recording it, being in the studio and and actually putting down what was on the record that everybody hears? The drummer Jeff Dugmore, who posted a thing, and and somebody made a comment about him playing on Mary's Prayer, and I said actually that was combination of a live hi-hat and Jed Grimes programming the beat on a Lin 9000. And it opened up this conversation between Jed and Dave Bascom, who was the producer, and me about what they remembered about the recording of Mary's Prayer. And I remember very clearly playing the piano in a studio called Townhouse, which was in London. And I also remember doing the vocal. There was something in the track whether it was in the tuning of the snare drum or something, but it kept throwing my pitch in the headphones. And I was going, just throwing my pitch. So Dave had the idea of something that he'd done before, which is where you actually don't wear headphones and you stand in the control room, you face the speakers, and they put the speakers out of phase so it doesn't go down the microphone. So I actually sang it with these NS10, Yamaha NS10 speakers standing in front of the speakers. I was literally in the room with the band when I did that vocal. Was it one of those things where you, like a method actor does, take yourself back to that moment to get that emotion, or was it just something that you'd sung it enough that you had it? That song by that time would have been four years old or something. So yeah, you're right. I actually had to sink myself back into the lyric again. And um, I, I used to do that with all songs, you know. When it got released, it got released three different times in the UK. First time it, 
it went to number 86. Now, when it would hit in America, I was just rooting for Mary's Prayer because it didn't sound like almost anything in the charts at that moment. No, I'd, ne I'd never been through this before, but our manager, Ian, had. And so he understood in the U.S. The, just the size of the country and obviously the, the system of radio um, where you'd work your way up through the formats. Radio pluggers would try to break a format first and hope that they could cross it over into top 4 AM. So it was a long trajectory that a record has. Albeit a minor hit, it was a hit, you know. Well, it hit number six on the AC charts in America too, so it was a, a top 10 hit on that chart. Which probably encouraged them to release it the second time. And then the third time, the third time um, was a little later, and Radio One, which was the most powerful radio station, still it still is to a large extent. They ran a poll at the end of the year for listeners to vote for the songs that they think thought should have been a hit that weren't hits. And Mary's Prayer won by some huge margin, like it got two times as many votes as any as the one in number two position or something. And that's when Virgin went, we have to release this again. And, and I was actually. Oh, please, no. I was kind of embarrassed, you know. I was like, you, you crazy? We're flogging a dead horse here, do you know what I mean? Like, this horse is deceased. And I'm very glad that I lost the argument, you know. And then that time, it just went super fast. The first time when it hit number 86 in the U.S., it hits number 6 on the AC charts, number 23 on the overall The Hot 100. It should have been a number one hit. Mm, thank you. But it seems to have just had this thing in the last... I would say probably five years or something. Where I don't know what it is, but it seems to have hit a lot of people's consciousness again. And it's getting more and more radio play here. It keeps re-entering the top 100, like it's done a few times. I thought for sure when it was on Something About Mary that it would skyrocket in, in America. And I think it did in the way that people who remembered the song because when i when i saw that i was i was loving that that they used that in there pre-story to that actually and that um the farley brothers apparently are huge fans of that song and they actually made a request to put it in um dumb and dumber a request which I and my publisher approved, and we thought it was going to go in Dumb and Dumber, but for whatever reason, it hit the cutting room floor. And th there's a character called Mary in Dumb and Dumber as well. And apparently, they were like, this next movie, we are definitely putting Mary's prayer in it. <laughs> you know, and they, they sealed the deal by calling it the something about Mary. <laughs> so, um, I'm very grateful for that. And obviously that helped it reach a whole other audience again and give it another kick. And then that's, that's got to be whatever it was, 15 years after its release or something. Like that. The music video is so classic. A lot of people are finding it. It's a classic. It really is a classic music video. It's got the, all that imagery that kind of 80s art and, and the way that they do the music video where you're shadow and you're singing and then the shadows of the other guys in the band. Like, that's so 80s. It's so 80s. It's all the, the real 80s. But it was brilliant how they, they pulled that off because they just, like I said, they show the idea of who Mary is for like three or four seconds at the end, and then they pull off of it. And so it does leave you a little bit in mystery. It's funny to me because I always felt that, and, I, and it's not that I dislike it, I actually really like the video as a pop video, but I, um, I never really felt that it connected emotionally to the song. I just felt it was a good advert for the song. But it's interesting you saying that, that you do think it does actually connect emotionally to the song. So I think that's a really that's cool you know, to hear that from somebody else. From my perspective, I guess, it would have been the first video that we had ever made. And so we were probably more hung up on the details and just, you know. And then we were learning a lot as well. I mean, it was the first time that we'd appeared in front of, I mean, the, from, from our uh, our involvement in the video, we didn't really have to do that much. It was like a half day shoot or something where we just performed that song and they had a, and and then as you say, they did the classic 80s. Like now we do a shot where you're looking at him, now we do a shot where you're looking at him and all that stuff. Like 
most of the work of that video is in Sue and Donna's um, animation illustration stuff, which is really what they do. If you shake the tree too hard, Bobby's gonna break. But uh, yeah, I mean, it certainly didn't, it certainly worked. I always like the eye and when it's in the, the light coming out of the abstract art. And I remember that the girl's name was Tatiana in real life. I think every, everybody in the band had a crush on her. She was gorgeous. And actually Jed got to do this. Jed's hand, you know, the bit where the girl's hand and the, and the guy's hand did that. Jed had the best. They took a look at everybody's hands and Jed got, Jed got the job of hand model. Well, it was nominated for Best Song Musically and Lyrically at the Novello nomination, right? That was a great day. I was I was um, sat next to Lamont Dozier, the, the great American songwriter, and I shouldn't really be saying this. Oh God, I'm stuck. So what? Um, I, I was sat next to Lamont Dozier, and um, Sting won the award with "They Dance Alone." Dance alone. Lamont Dozier just said in my ear. Your song's way better than that. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I mean, that meant, you know, I got the award, really. And that was what made my century. So. I had a chance to interview Lamont Dozier for like three and a half hours. It was one of the greatest moments of my life because I'm a huge Motown fan. The thing about Lamont Dozier is he he listens to modern music. I mean, he's he was right. on top of it. And so... There's no yeah. doubt that he listened to that song and was a fan because he was always had his, his ear to the ground. There's a lot of covers that have been done. Jason Donovan. B.B. Mack did a cover of it. Being here is heavenly. What was really cool, though, is it was just used in the film Blinded by the Light. Will you go out with me? I mean, again, it's those little things that keep the song alive and keep it in people's consciousness. And, you you know, you, I'm just really grateful for all of those little things because they all add up to that thing when you say it's a classic. That's what that means, really, that it just keeps coming back. Well, those kind of movies are trying to place you in that moment in the 80s of where this kid was and blinded by the light and what was inspiring him and... So the fact that they chose that and, and a few other songs to place you in that moment, that just shows that that, that was a song that was in the collective consciousness of, of people. And to end on on this song as we, we move on, I, I love um, the fact that you did re-perform it with the band Ryder Cup uh, for the gala, the opening gala Ryder Cup at Hydro Arena, right, in Glasgow. Yeah, yeah. That was really cool that performance is on youtube and and you guys just killed it the first gig i've done in 30 years in front of 15,000 people and playing together with those guys is like jed and kit it's like second nature really that just instantly everybody locked back in together again but one of the problems that we've always had is not really like the will to do something that's actually getting everybody in the same room at the same time because Jed is the bass player and for the last 10 years or more now he's been the bass player in Simple Minds and they tour constantly and I mean I'd love to do something else with him at some point but like I say it's just so difficult to get everybody's schedules to coordinate you know I read at the time that you gave an interview, you said something like, I certainly don't think it's the best song in the album. It's probably the most accessible, therefore the best choice for the single. Uh, and there's a young guy saying that back in the day. What does it mean to you so many years later? Because like I told you, this song has meant so much to me as I've gone through. Mostly at the time, it, it, it's hit my heart when I've been in a relationship that's not good where I'm regretting a past love because I'm with somebody that doesn't measure up to that. Now... I'm in a marriage where I'm completely in love. And so I listen to that song and think, man, I, I reached that level of Mary. You know, it's not an idea anymore in my mind. I, I'm here. This is amazing. But what does it mean to you? Uh, well, it means a lot of things in a lot of different um, 
context in a sense. It was really interesting talking to you there because you really understand the song, you really got inside it. And that's the first time I think I've ever really talked about it lyrically that deeply. So I was I was actually feeling those emotions again and remembering it. So the song obviously still has um some kind of power to it. It was um but the the song has also saved my life a number of times, you know, in a very in it just in its I mean, financially, you know, like the roller coaster of being a songwriter, it's not always an easy road. Mary's Prayer a number of times is like, a, you know, a movie cut will come in or whatever, and that'll keep me going for another few months. So it's 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 been a friend and it's been... But then the other thing, and I got a letter just this morning, um, the, I, social media has meant that a lot of people can reach out to you in a way that they couldn't before and to tell you what the song means to them. And I think what's amazing about it is that it, how much, how deeply it touches so many people's lives, but also that it's different for every single one of them. It means something different to them. And, and I mean, I, th I don't think it's all a million miles apart, but people love it because their mother was called Mary or, you know, like there's a lot of things that, that or, or their, their wife or whatever it is. And and so social media has meant that I'm now able to actually understand just how much it means to a lot of people. And that's really beautiful as well. You know, that's a newish thing. And it, and it continues. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about this classic 80s hidden gem and about Danny Wilson. Do you remember this song, first of all? What is your take on it? You can hear it below in our link, we'll link to that. If you like our videos, we do invite you to subscribe below to be a part of our community. And remember to give you even more content and to help our mission of getting the stories behind all the great artists and the songs, that's the goal. Hit us up on Patreon, help us keep the music alive. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.